guys. Can you hear me? Are we going to get this right this time? <laughs> Happy Sabbath to you all. Welcome. You are most welcome to be joining our Sabbath stream right now, wherever it is that you are. Whether it is snowy out there, whether it is sunny out there, you can guess what it is in Peoria right now. But you know what? It's not so bad, is it? It's not so bad. It's snowy out, but it's like a nice kind of snow that's just there. It's not the kind of snow that's in your way. Where uh, where my wife and I live, they never plow our street, so we have to wait for it to melt naturally. So it's it's um we're at that spot where it has melted naturally. It's there if you want to see it. It looks pretty, but you don't really have to deal with it too much. So, anyways, but maybe you're on the beach somewhere watching on your phone, wherever it is that you are watching from. You are most welcome to our Sabbath stream here, the Peoria Seventh Day Adventist Church. I see a bunch of you guys have joined us on YouTube and Facebook. Yay! We're going to be starting Kahoot in just a few minutes. For those of you who may not know, that is going to be our quiz program. You're going to need to get that Kahoot app on your phone, or you can just pull up the browser, which is uh, the address is kahoot.it. So you can get the app for your smartphone. You can go to kahoot.it and join us there. All right. Laura's saying, yeah, snow, go away. It's a it's a ongoing conversation with my wife and I whenever we talk about uh, going on vacation. I'm like, we could go to the mountains, we could go camping, we could go, you know, into the forest, we could go to the Grand Canyon. And my wife's response is always beach, 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 beach. It's the only place she wants to go. So pray for the pastor, would you? All right. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everybody. Get your Kahoot pin locked in. I see a number of you guys are in the game right now, and we're happy for that. We have got Diana as our teacher today, and we have Ben as our, I don't know what we're going to call it, co-teacher, uh, guest, guru, subject matter expert, whatever we want to call Ben. He's waiting in the green room right now <clears throat> for Sabbath school. All right. We've got a few people there for Kahoot. I don't think we have any other real church business, anything to discuss here, any big announcements. So I think we can probably go into Kahoot and uh, sit in the waiting room here with everybody else. There you guys are. All right. We've got that pin up. Some of you guys have already jumped in. Radiant chicken, balanced crab, cute possum, fuzzy pony, golden possum. There's always like two of at least one animal every week. And, um, yeah, this week it's possums. Why? Fuzzy pony, glad kitten, caring snail. All of you guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, as usual, we'd love to know who you guys are. Oh, my wife wants to react to the, uh, the unfairness of her, her beach preference. There's no other place to be where it's warm, sandy, and sunny. Yeah, but you act like those are all of the best things. All right. Happy Sabbath says 3G. Well, happy Sabbath to you as well. All right. We got eight players in the game waiting on maybe a couple more. As I see people are joining our stream. We've had a number of people just joining us recently. Happy to have us. Nine, happy to have you, rather. Okay. So we have, um, let's see here, Silver Fox. Yeah, Glowing Goat. All right. So we have, uh, we still have our two possums. It's the only Radiant Chicken. I really want to know who Radiant Chicken is. <laughs> that is awesome that is awesome okay we're going to give you guys all another minute if you are trying to get something done in the kitchen trying to chase the kids around the house whatever it may be at home and you want to get to get yourselves into kahoot this is your chance all right amusing penguin has joined us i also want to know who that person is no prizes in the month of january just playing to kind of Test your, your Bible knowledge. It's not really a, a competition. We gave out prizes in December. But uh, we'll do it again at some point, probably around Easter. But uh, this is just all based on the Sabbath school lesson, usually based on the, the texts that are brought up by the Sabbath school lesson, sometimes based on what the lesson itself says. There will be one of those questions today. And you'll get the hang of it real, real, real quick if you haven't done it before. All right. We're going to do our 10-second countdown, and then we are going to get going with Kahoot. All right. So if you need to join, just like Wonder Gecko just did, get it all now. All right. 
Laura says, uh, all are winners. Yeah, but we don't do participation trophies here, all right? If you do want to let us know which player you are at the end of Kahoot, we'd love to know. Put it on the screen. It's just fun. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Let's start. See what happens, guys. All right. Okay, here we go. All right. Here's the question. What is your favorite way to have a potato? This question is not worth any points. Okay, so you can pick whatever answer you want. Mashed, fried, baked, hashed. I know this does not even exhaust all of the options, but uh, this is my favorite. We're going to call it a vegetable. This is my favorite. All right, which way do you like it? Mashed, fried, baked, hashed. You might even like it twice baked. That's the case. Hit baked. That was one of my favorites growing up. And then uh, I grew up and I realized how much work it is. And then, nope. All right. Which way? We got 10 answers so far. Good, 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 good. Which way is your favorite way to have a potato? Let us know. Okay, here we go. We're going to find out the answer here in just 10 seconds. Some of you, one of you at least, is still thinking about this one. Right? <laughs> this, is a, this is an existential crisis for you. All right. Most of you guys said fried or baked. You guys are thinking of French fries there. Only one of you said mashed. Okay. Three of you hashed. You like them breakfast that way? Sure, sure, sure. All right. Kind of disappointed in the mashed group. I wonder, I wonder if this is related to uh, ease of access, like it's easier to get fried potatoes, you know, French fried or whatever. Uh, it's easier to find baked potatoes at restaurants and stuff. Um, I don't know. It's easy to find mashed potatoes too, I guess. But it's harder to make that at home or it takes longer, I guess. More work. Anyways, all right. We're not going to we're not gonna employ our Freud skills on that one. Okay, so of course, no points. We're going to get on to question number two. This one is worth points. Now you know how the game works. You got the hang of it. This was in the lesson. According to Confucius... Which of these things was most essential for good government? <laughs> what a weird question, isn't it? Is it food? That's your red answer. Confidence. Confidence in your elected officials. Is it weapons? I mean, hey, that was important, especially in the ancient world. If you can't defend yourself, you don't have anything. Uh, or is it arable land? Land that can be farmed uh, and improved upon, right? You got to think about when Confucius is saying this. Maybe farming isn't uh, isn't seen as as essential as it used to be. It is still very essential, but you know, a lot of people work in cities and offices now. A lot less farmers in America in the developed world. Okay, so what is it? Which is the most essential thing for good government? We're going to find out in just a second. What did Confucius say? Confidence. All right. Most of you guys got that exactly correct. He says, uh, hey, you don't always have food in a country. You uh, you don't always have weapons. But if you can't trust your leaders, uh, then it doesn't matter if you have food and weapons. Right. That was his point. You may agree. You may disagree. It does not matter. Uh, we're going to move on because we could preach a sermon about this right now. Uh, <laughs> all right. Wonder Gecko is doing very well in first place. Caring Snail, Fuzzy Pony, Amusing Penguin, followed by Glowing Goat rounding out the top five. Remember, the quicker you answer, the more of those those points you get. Each question is worth a thousand points. So the, you want to answer quickly and accurately. Okay, what is the feast day where the high priest can enter the most holy place? What is that day called? Is it Day of Atonement? Is it Feast of Tabernacles? Is it Purim? Is it Passover? What do we call that day? What do we call that day when the high priest can enter the most holy place or the holy of holies? What do we call that day? Wow, does Kahoot really say we have 512 answers? <laughs> Somebody's cheating. I'm going to welcome Vladimir Putin to this game. It's nice to have you. All right. <laughs> The Russian hackers have found us. Let's, I can't wait to see what the answers are going to be because I wonder if that's just a little glitch on their website or whether that's indicative of, uh, I don't know what that would be indicative of. 
we're going to see a lot of a uh, lot of votes. Okay, here we go. Which day is that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. <laughs> it's the day of atonement. That is the correct one. I have no idea actually how many of you guessed that. I'm wondering if the no, I was going to say maybe the the right most number is the correct one, 5 3 3 and 4, but uh, yeah, I don't know. All right. Let's see what happens now to the standings. Oh, man, we lost our... Okay, Wonder Gecko's still there. Um, Amazing Penguin, Glowing Goat, Silver Fox moving up into the ranks. Well done. Here's a true-false question. And this one is worth double points. We usually don't do this. We usually don't do double point questions on true or false because uh, it's like 50-50, right? It's a lot of points to give with a 50% chance of getting it correct. All right. So is it true or false? A seraph has four wings this is in the book of isaiah you guys covered this is it true or false a seraph has four wings how many wings does a seraph have all eight million of you who are playing right now that's kind of incredible all right how many wings does a seraph have i'm not going to mention which chapter in isaiah talks about this but it's one of them and it was covered by your lesson you have about 20 seconds to finish scrambling to figure this one out. You say, well, Matthew, is it unfair that some people can look these things up in their Bible? Maybe not everybody has a Bible near them. Well, that's true. But if you're going to look it up in your Bible, chances are you're not going to find the answer until you have about the least amount of points remaining to get. Right? The longer you wait, the less you get. Let's see what happens here. Well, we can tell more people got it correct, saying it is false. How many wings does a seraph have? Let me know in the comments, and I'll put it up on the screen. And we're going to move on. How many wings does a seraph have? Somebody tell us, for those who don't know. Fuzzy Pony! Oh, we lost our gecko. What is happening here? We do have some other people joining us. Interesting. All right. Where were the seraphim, that's that's uh, plural, where were the seraphim positioned in this throne room? Were they next to God, behind God, above God? All right, Katie. K. Wolfer says uh, six. That is correct. Are they kneeling before God? Are they? Are they? Where are they? Are they above God, behind God, next to God, kneeling before God? Where are the seraphim positioned in in Isaiah? Where are they in relation to God? This is a really interesting thing. I wish the lesson would talk a little bit more about it, but of course, the lesson can't cover everything. Uh, it's worth it's worth talking about sometime though. And what does this mean? What does this mean? Where are they positioned? You may think this is a, a real small thing. 16 seconds left for all of you people who have uh, started joining us. All right. What is the answer? Which one is it? Four seconds. You better answer quickly. All right. They are above God. They're above God. All right. So that could mean several different things, right? Are they flying like high above God's head? Or maybe that just means they're standing over God as he is seated. Um, but that's how they are described in about every translation. Okay, let's get on to the next one. Let's see what happens here. Fuzzy Pony is out. We have some bots, it looks like, that are uh, just auto-answering this. This is really interesting. I mean, look at that. Like, those answers just flying up, and it's skewing our results. This is an intriguing situation that has happened to us. All right, which king of Israel has died in chapter 6? Which king of Israel died in chapter 6? Is it Jotham, Ahaz, Uzziah, Hezekiah? Which one is it? Isaiah served under all four of those kings. Which one is the one that died in chapter 6? So yeah, it does look like we have 700 and some bots <laughs> that, have just, that have joined our game somehow and have just uh, are just auto-answering all the questions. And of course, since they answer quickly, uh they're gonna get a maximum amount of points somehow maybe even more points than is possible this is going to be a really intriguing thing to to sort out later on but we're gonna keep playing finishing up the game all right here we go let's see what the answer is it is uzziah so congratulations you got that right looks like well i would say it looks like a minority got that correct but since there's a bunch of uh whatever these are that have uh, <laughs> joined us it's hard to say here's the final question here's the final question what did isaiah volunteer to do 
What did Isaiah volunteer to do? All right. This is intriguing here. Because it looks like we're back to normal. Two answers have been given so far. I don't know. All right. So what did Isaiah volunteer to do? This is going to be in chapter 6. I don't mind telling you. Did he volunteer to call Israel to repent, to open hearts, to help the blind to see, to make hearts callous? What did Isaiah volunteer to do? Remember that Remember that scene where God's like, hey, who are we going to send? And Isaiah's like, ooh, 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 pick me, pick me. Okay, that's in Matthew's translation. Uh, and God says, all right, here's what you're going to go do. Here's what I want you to go tell the people. All right. What did God tell Isaiah to go say? What did he volunteer to go do? Better answer quickly. You got about 10 seconds left, 7 seconds left, all that. And this is for all the big ones. I have no idea how this final score is going to go. I reckon not, that we're probably not going to see anybody, uh, <laughs> any of us, on the top five. But uh, I'd be curious to know uh, what position. Okay, a lot of you said call Israel to repent. That's a good guess, and no doubt he did do that. But uh, this is not what God sent Isaiah to do in chapter 6 to make their hearts callous. Three of you guys got that correct. Well, let's see what the final standings look like. What a weird situation. Yeah, I don't know who these people are. But, uh, hey, I want to know what position you guys got. All right, so obviously we can't see uh, who... Oh, Glowing Goat. Who's Glowing Goat? You guys, you beat the bots. You beat the Terminators. <laughs> who is Glowing Goat? We must know. We must know who Glowing Goat is. And uh, I recognize that... Uh, you know, some people got uh, different scores. You guys can let us know what your score is, and we can sort out maybe what, what spot you are in. But Glowing Goat, congratulations to Glowing Goat. Did a fantastic job. Proud of you. You, you beat the machines. You're like that, that old story of the guy who was putting in the railroad with his hammer, beating the machine, you know, trying to prove that he could do it faster than the machine. Uh, that's it. You've done it. You beat the computer. You are smarter than a computer. Now you can go on Jeff Foxworthy's show and see if you're smarter than a fifth grader. It's the next step up after you beat a computer. Okay. Well, I think that's about it. All right. Looks like uh, Al says uh, Esther and I were silver fox, and you got five out of seven. All right. Well done. Well done, guys. I got uh, like four out of seven because I'm, I'm over here just like randomly tapping my phone and tapping the answer. So, hey, not bad for randomly selecting things. As always, thank you for joining us for Kahoot. We are going to go into Sabbath school here in just a moment. And uh, Diana is going to be your teacher. We have a little video to show you first about how you can get your Sabbath school lesson. If you don't know how to do that, if you've never been a part of an Adventist Sabbath school, if you haven't, you don't have to be Adventist. You're welcome. You can leave your comments and questions in the chat. Your teacher will see it and, uh, and, and, and interact with you. And that's how we're going to have this class. Of course, Ben is going to be joining us as well. So we're looking forward to that. So let's get going, because Sabbath School Live is starting. Welcome to Sabbath School. This is a time in our worship when we Adventists gather to study the Bible together. Seventh-day Adventists around the world pick a subject or a book of the Bible and follow this adult Bible study guide. The guide keeps us all on the same page a way of focusing our conversation on a specific idea so that we get the most out of it. Your teacher may follow it closely or just use it as a conversation starter. Either way, you should get one at absg.adventist.org. You can just download a PDF and have it ready by class time, which starts in just a few moments. Your teacher loves it when you ask questions so feel free to leave your comments on Facebook and YouTube, and we'll make sure your teacher sees them. This quarter, we're studying the book of Isaiah. According to Bible Gateway, Isaiah is one of the most read books of the Bible. I think if we're honest, we'd admit that we really don't know Isaiah as much as we ought. That makes it a great book to study. So go get your Bible study guide and get ready for class Peoria Sabbath School Live starts now.
Good morning. Happy Sabbath. We're having an earbud issue. Okay. Welcome today. Um, today we're do, talking about a uh, crisis of leadership. And uh, yay, Esther and um, Al. Good job. And Laura, don't be crabby. It's okay. It really is. Okay, I'm going to start out with a word of prayer, and uh, we'll go from there. Dear Heavenly Father, I would just ask that you would please be with us today and that you would help us to uh, open your book and learn more about you. And Father, as we study, um, may we open our hearts to your character and what it is you desire to change in our lives. We ask these things in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Very good. Okay. I am going to be joined by Ben at some point. Um, but crisis of leader, leadership. Um, so I always like to look at the picture. And what I'm seeing today is a crown and, and a broken sword. And I know that um, the sword in the Bible talks about what um, the word. And in Ephesians, it talks about the sword being the, our ability to um, be, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one with God. And this sword is broken. And that's what happened to God's people. So, let's go on. Hi, Ben. Good morning. Can Hello, you hear me? It's good to see you. Yeah, I can hear you. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to deal with the listening to me talk and listening to me talk in my ear. And that's kind of strange. That's <laughs> never fun. Echoes are never fun. Yeah, I didn't know that was going to happen. So, we'll get, we'll get with it. So, um, Sabbath afternoon. Uh, it talks about Confucius, those of you who played Kahoot. Um, he really was about what was important, and that's confidence in your government, confidence in your leaders. And at this time in Israel's history, they didn't have a lot of confidence. But let's, let's go back a little bit with that. I, I want to read from... Um, Second Chronicles, and that's chapter 26. And I want to read about Uzziah. So, is everybody there? Hey, Dave, it's good to see you. Well, you know, hear from you anyway. Okay, Second Chronicle, chapter 26. Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old. Can you imagine a 16-year-old six, being a king? And he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah, of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord God, he made him prosper. Now he went out and made war against the Philistines, broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabneh, in the wall of Ashdod, and he built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians who lived in the Gerbal, and against the Mennonites. Now I'm going to skip down to um, verse 11. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of fighting men who went out to war by companies 
according to the number on their roll as prepared by Jael, the scribe, and Manasiah, the officer, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. So Uzziah had an army. He also had material prosperity, um, and Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, this is verse 9, at the valley gate and at the corner buttress of the wall. Then he fortified them. Also, he built towers in the desert. He dug many wells where he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. And now down to verse 12, the total number of chief officers of the mighty men of valor was 2,600. And under their authority was an army of 307,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. Now on verse 15, it talks about his fame. And he made devices in Jerusalem invented by skillful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. What does it mean to be, become strong? What was it? I read that as confidence. Yeah. Like he became uh, self-confident and, and with himself. And I think that's an interesting thing to think about being a 16 year old and growing up in that position, um, you know, how, how did that, what was that transition like? I don't think as a 16 year old, he was that with it. Right, right. Well, it was, it was an interesting environment to definitely to be growing up in. But I think but, also like he's limited, right? And then he yes. became confident. Yeah. It's like, I've got this now. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, anybody here have that problem? <laughs> Me? You? <laughs> How about the rest of us? We get to a point where we think we got this. And, wow, we don't. Or at least I don't. Maybe you do, Ben. Ted says the Lord gave him strength and it was conditional. Yes. Yes, it was. Okay. Well, on to 16. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Could he have picked a worse thing to do? I mean, wow. Yeah, why did he do that? Was that the last thing that he couldn't do? You know, I, I, think, I think when you have that kind of power and you have that kind of fame, and I think we've seen that with people that are like in Hollywood and, and, you know, power around the country. They're always looking for that one more unattainable or one more, one more thrill, one more yeah. something, you know? That's not us either. No, definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> so Isaiah the priest went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men, and they withstood King Uzziah, and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You have no honor from the Lord God. Well, okay, so he's rebuked, and this is what he does. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was angry with the priests, Leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. Okay, so the Holy of Most Holies, I'm assuming, is definitely supposed to be really clean and, off and here's the leper yeah. in the most holy place wow 
Well, because he would be unclean fully, and so he wouldn't even be able to participate in sacrifices, right? So he wouldn't even right. be allowed inside the temple whatsoever. Ever. It was interesting I, in that he gets a chance. Do you think he gets a chance to repent? Because well, it says that you're in the wrong place, and then he says, then he, and he had kind of a choice, right? It's like either I'm going to be defiant or, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was in the wrong place. <laughs> Yeah, in 19, there was that, that opportunity. And because of who he was, he thought it was okay. And he became furious. And, you know, he had this sensor in his hand. And I've seen pictures of what they think that looked look like. And that could be a weapon. The sensor? Yeah. No, so, no. you know, I don't know. And that's, I just, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking at the end of 18 there, it's like he's doing something that's clearly wrong. And I was kind of contrasting that with uh, when um, the guy reached up to steady the um, ark when it was being transported. Right. I mean, that was instant, right? Instantly yes. dead. And then Aaron's sons, when they take unholy fire into mm -hmm. the same location, instant. Like there's no, mm -mm. there's no second, you know what I mean? It's instant. But yet this is not. First of all, God's not involved. God's not involved until after he's been um, refuted by by another human. You know, I just think that the interplay there is so interesting. Yeah, he was defiant. He could have died, but I think it meant more for him to to be struck down with leprosy and then have to live the rest of his, you know, his life in that condition. Well, it's a memorial so, of what you do. What happens if you? Uh, or refuting God. Yeah. So verse 21. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Then Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. That's it. It was over. So much for that pride going before a fall. <laughs> Okay, let's see, what do we have here? Yeah, Dave, his humility before the God, you gave him everything. Everything was replaced with pride. Oh, that's Catherine's, yes. And Ted, we can try to justify sin, but it's still sin. He thought his position allowed him to violate God's laws. Do we ever, you know, I, I wanted to talk about presumption. Did he presume that it was okay? Well, it's just such a weird thing. That's why I don't understand what... There's so many other things that he could have violated. There's so many other things that he could have done, um, you know, that would be against God. And it seems so odd that he would choose that one. To me, at least. You know, it, it's... Um, you know, I don't know. It's just... It, was that the final place that he wasn't allowed or something? I think. I think that was the deal. I can go anywhere, but there. I'm king. I can do what I want. I'm going. So I sound like a wonder. kid. <laughs> yeah. I wonder <laughs> if he was like fully, but he had done everything else, and then he needed to do that, or if he was restrained. You know, we don't get as much insight into, you know, like, was he living a, a David or a Solomon-like lifestyle where, you know, uh, excesses of all kinds. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, Tim, it it said it, it's like what what I don't know. It just seems a very interesting. Like, I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna burn the incense. You watch me. <laughs> <laughs> he missed he missed that lesson when it came to the sanctuary and you know service. I I don't know I don't well, know I don't where know. his head I, was. I think he knew but, exactly what he was doing, right? I'm sorry. Say it again. I I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think he missed anything. I think he was like, no, I will do this. No, I, I, I think he missed the, if you do this, you're going to be dead part. I think he I missed that. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder if he did, though. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, uh, presumption. We, we presume a lot of things in our life, and I, I think it's dangerous. Um. When I was teaching, I 
I had young people who would come in and take a test and say, well, I prayed that morning, so I'm going to do great. And I'm thinking, but did you study? Uh, well, no, not really. Well, I hate to tell you this, but <laughs> I'm not sure God's going to honor your prayer if you didn't prepare. Uh, Tim's talking about the, what was the inc incense used for? Well, what was it used for? Wasn't that the communication with God, the prayers going up to heaven? Was there more insight there? He wanted a more direct talking to God. God knew his heart. Evidently not. What do you think, Ben? Ooh, I stumped him. It's <laughs> like, I he knew exactly what he was doing. He could have anything. Yeah. He needed something. There was something yeah. he needed, and there's something in him that he needed to accomplish. And either that was he was uh, too big for his own britches, and he wanted to <laughs> be able to do that, or or was he reaching out for something? Was he, do, you know, I, I I think there's so much there's so much complexity to it. And and again, that whole the thing where he got a chance. He was not immediately judged, even though he knew he should be immediately judged. Mm -hmm. it, it's, uh, you know, it's an insight into, I, I guess we'll never know, or we won't know until we can ask God directly or something. But it's like, you know, was he having a breakdown? I mean, there's so many things that you can think about. Like, why is he in that place at that time doing something that he knows is wrong? And what does that, what does that say to us? How can we apply that to that our own life? Do we assume, presume, that God is always going to rescue, that we can do whatever we want, and I'll go home and repent, and I'm okay, because I, sorry? How does that work? Is that, you know, I look at this yeah. as a breach in his relationship with God, and I, I wonder, you know, God fills us. He fills me. He gives me everything I need. And you talked about the fact that he was needing something. What was it that he needed? That one more thrill, that one more thing, that one more, don't touch this as a little kid because I'm going to touch it because I can't. So in a relationship with God, he should fill all of our needs. And yet he had a need. So I'm not sure his relationship with God was one that... Um, was as good as it could have been. Uh, Al says prosperity can sometimes blind us to our need of God, which leads us to presume instead of continuing to abide in God. Well, and I think I agree with Al because the, the yeah. when you become more successful and you're lauded as being successful, which I'm assuming it, this doesn't <laughs> happen to me, but I'm sure in the future, <laughs> At some point, you know what I mean. You can build, you can build yourself up, and you can start to believe the myths that other people believe about you. Right. And and I think he could he could have really suffered from that. It, it's just such an, it, it, an interesting, you know, he could have rallied armies and destroyed other places that he shouldn't have, or he could have you know, taken hundreds more wives or whatever he could have done, and instead, he chooses to to do this one thing. It's very fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, it was interesting. he was he a, we, sorry, he ahead. says we jump ahead of God's plan. We must trust in our own righteousness. And I wonder what was God's plan? You know, it, did he feel stalled? Maybe, maybe he felt stalled and maybe he did want to connect more. I mean, it's all, you know, um, we'll never yeah, know, I, but it, it's such an odd way to react and outburst. Yeah. And he was alive for many years after that. And I think that was an example. But then, okay, good discussion, good comments. Um, Ted said more people are pulled away from God than prosper from prosperity than by want. And, and that's what was happening to the children of Israel at this time. They, they were in a political upheaval. Their king died. And they hadn't seen him for years because they didn't have what we have, like TV where you could put a screen in there and a microphone and, and do it via remote or anything. I mean, they were not allowed near him. And so he led a very 
quiet, I'm going to assume humble life for the rest of his life. Um, anyway, let's go into now Isaiah 6. So Isaiah 1 through 5 talked a lot about what was going on with the, the people, their hearts, uh, where they were at in their relationship with God. Um, and unlike some of the other books of the Bible, Isaiah is not called right away. He's not introduced right away as a prophet until right here in chapter 6. And I think that's um, interesting to know. Jeff talks about being confused with needs more than wants. Yeah, that's us today. What do we need? What do we want? We need God, but do we really want him? I've always wondered, do we want him and just need him to fill in the, fill in the blanks and, and uh, okay, thanks, I'll do this on my own. I got this. And how many times a day do we do that? Often, I think, at least for me. Okay. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. What does that mean? The train of his robe. I, I think about the, the weddings in England, and they have the train on the bride that goes down the entire aisle of Westminster Abbey. Is that what we're talking about here? The train of his robe. I think it means that his very presence just saturated the throne room, if it's a room. I don't know. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. Do we have other angels described as this in other books? I know Ezekiel talks about this, and I also think there's... a. Uh, in Revelation, let's see, 4, hang on here, Revelation 4, 8, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes and around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, a God of the past, the present, and the future. How wonderful. But in verse 3, the angels are um, singing another song. I, I think they're singing. I don't think they're just speaking. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. When you read that, what does that say to you? The whole earth is full of his glory. What does that mean? What does that say? He impacts everything. Yeah. I think he's around. Sometimes it's hard to feel that or see it, but he's around. He has that ability if we let him. The one thing about God is he, he will go with you if you invite him. And he, he will go with you if you don't invite him. But he doesn't have the same same ability to help you if there's no invitation. So the whole earth is full of his glory tells me the invitation is, is everywhere and always there. And I think that's cool yeah. for us as people. I think when Jesus tells us that we, we only get because we don't ask. Yeah. The Lord wants to do so much for us and yet we don't yeah. ask him. You know? Yeah. Verse 4. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. How many people have had that opportunity to actually see God? And, and what did it do for them? I think of Moses going up the hill, you know, the mountain, uh, to get the Ten Commandments. And he came down. He was 
they had to cover his face because it was so bright and and they couldn't look upon they couldn't look upon him after he had actually seen the backside of God and here's Isaiah and he's in his presence it changed Moses' life and as we will see it changed Isaiah's life also so one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tong with from the altar and he touched my mouth with it and said behold this has touched your lips your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged wow can you imagine interesting isn't it i think about you know what those coals were used for and they were used to to light the lights to make sure everything was um, always bright um, and to you know get the incense going if it perchance you know wasn't as going it's like starting a fire in the barbecue you need to have enough fire to do whatever you're you're cooking in that he took one of those and touched his mouth and it was good it was good also I heard the voice of the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for now my version says us right there God is not alone he has his son and the Holy Spirit and who, then I said I'm sorry Ben say again in eight you're talking about in eight yes okay here am I send me we uh, really quick I'll read Al's comment there Al says he loves uh, 60 verse 1 and 2 arise and shine for light has come and the glory of the Lord rises up on you see darkness covers the earth and thinks darkness is over the peoples but the Lord rises up to you and his glory appears over you uh, Ted says the change was immediately and uh, after Isaiah expressed his repentance, I think that's true. And he does this especially when he chooses, like Isaiah, to see, yes. here I am, Lord Jesus, send me. Um, yeah, it's interesting that Isaiah has to be present and willing to have that, the, the coal touch him. You know, um, it's not a forced thing. He's, he's there, and, and we can be part of that, I think. Are you back, Diana? Yeah. After. If you're in the moment, then you, you see this happening. I mean, wow. I, I just can't even imagine be Isaiah. So he said, here am I, send me. I, I love this verse in the Bible. This is something that I, I often say um, to myself, you know, send me. Where do you want me to go? Um, and I'm often stand back and think, I signed up for this. But, you know, it's interesting because once I say to the Holy Spirit, I'm going to do it, it's, it, it just happens. And it's, it's good to know you're not alone and things are, you know, working and he's going to be there. He's going to give you the words. He's going to take care of everything. And, you know, profound. It's not on you anymore. And again, you know, you looked at Uzziah and all of he wanted and all he needed and what he was lacking. And that relationship with God would have given him a lot more uh, positive things to do um, than to go somewhere he should have never went. Um, okay. So, any other thoughts? What do we have here? Um, Ted says the change was immediately after... Isaiah expressed his repentance, yes. Uh, Catherine had said, God's character fill all aspects of our lives. Yes, may he. Um, Al, this does, this especially when we choose, like Isaiah, to see, here am I, Lord, Jesus, send me. 
He desires our willingness to say, yes, I agree. It can be frightening, though, to say yes, especially when you don't think you're equipped to do what it is that you might be sent to do. And, well, you know, Isaiah, Isaiah didn't ask any questions. But he's really self-aware. Yeah. I mean, Isaiah is very self-aware. And he starts that with, I know I'm not worthy. I know mm -hmm. there are these problems. Help me fix these problems. Then he receives divine help to fix the problems in the form of a coal. And then he is freed from those problems. And he's confident to do what he knows needs to be done, which is send me. I'm ready. I like Tim's comment. He didn't say, here am I, send me. Uh, next Tuesday at 4 Thursday. 4.30, yeah. <laughs> <I have> that. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. And then Pastor says, I like how Isaiah says yes before he even knows what God wants him to say. And, you know, Tim says he was going, he was willing to go now. Didn't think about it. If you think about it, you got lots of reasons why you, you shouldn't or couldn't, can't. You just do it. And then... Here's what he tells him to go do. And I think to myself, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he said in verse 9, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their eyes heavy and shut their ears. I'm sorry, shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Wow, some satire there. I know, do you think you have to be sarcastic to be a, a follower of God? Because he's very <laughs> sarcastic. <laughs> well, that and lots of humor. <laughs> I think that's two requirements. So why did he say this? Why did he phrase it like that? Or why did he yeah. say that? I don't know. I've thought about think? that. I think because it makes, it makes a bigger impression and you have to think about it a little bit more. Because obviously his intent is not really to have that happen because Isaiah understands it right away. He's like, you know, what can I do to prevent this from happening? Um, I, I think it, it's almost one of those things where you kind of push... When you're in a little bit of leadership, you can push the push the envelope a little bit to to see people realize, oh, maybe I don't want to really go down that pathway. So then you can kind of pull back just a little bit, as opposed to, please, would you listen to me? Repent, will you please mm -hmm. repent and listen to me? You know. Right, right. Well, I think the interesting thing is is his response was. Really, this is the message? I think of Jonah, like, I don't want to do this. Or maybe he was forewarning him that the people wouldn't listen. So don't be discouraged because this is what they're, this is gonna, what they're gonna do. And so just keep moving. And, but he says, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate, the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land, but yet a tenth will be in it, and will return and be for consuming, as a terebeth tree or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. So it's not a forever. It is a temporary thing with this hardening of people's hearts. You know, the first five chapters talked about where they were. And I think Isaiah understood where the people were. And so this message to him, I don't think was unheard of. I don't think it's the first time he uh, really heard it. I think it was something he was, you know, intent upon doing and understanding. And, you know, what does that mean, hardening of the heart? What is that? How does that encase in, in things? Well, uh, we do get into that in the lesson, but I think, you know, two ways. Either we harden our own hearts, or there's examples where um, God has given circumstances that we react to by hardening our hearts, and, and, and that can be referred to as God hardens someone's heart. 
I think it's interesting though, in, in and I want to just jump back there to ten and twelve when okay. when God is explaining what's going to happen. But I I don't necessarily know if it's a foregone conclusion at that point as much as you know this is what's going to happen. But because in eight he's like, who will go there? Who will we send? And Isaiah's like, I'll I'll do it. I will go tell the people. I will go help them. And then he comes back and he says, but well, it's not even worth it. Almost, <laughs> you know. And I guess that's one way to read it. But it's also uh, you have a hard task ahead of you, but someone will listen or what you are doing has promise. It, it's yes. important that you do it. You know, he's not dissuaded because in 11, Isaiah doesn't say, ah, I don't want to go or he doesn't play like a Moses. Like, well, I can't do it. You know, right. He's just like, well, how, how long do I have? What what can I do? And what, right. can, how long do I have? Yeah. Yeah. Is there a time frame before your judgment becomes more? Yeah. You know, it says in the lesson on Thursday, um, one, two, third paragraph down, that last sentence, God's role and that of his servants is to give people a fair choice so that they will have adequate warning, even if they end up choosing destruction and exile. And basically, they were choosing exile. And as we read on, that's what happened. It's interesting that you pulled that out because I pulled that out too. And all of that was related to the people who are warning. Right. If you, if you read in Isaiah 6, 11 through 13, it's like, no, no, no. If you tell them, then your soul will be clean even if they fall into destruction. But if you don't say anything, you are complicit in their destruction. Right, right. Um, the paragraph before, it said, God keeps an appealing to them in order to give them more and more opportunities to repent. Yet the more they resist, the harder they become. So in that sense, what God does to them results in the hardening of their hearts. Even though he would rather that these actions soften them, God's love toward us is unchanging. Our individual response to his love is the crucial variable. And I think that says a lot about the people of that day. And, you know, sometimes people will come to us and say something to us, and we're a King um, Uzziah, Reba Bell. We don't want to hear it. And then there are times when people come and say something to us, uh, maybe as a, a gentle uh, rebuke, and we give uh, some time to what they have to say, and we want to think about it. And I think that that's hard as Christians to rebuke and so this is what Isaiah's job was. He was going to go rebuke a nation. Wow. And he was willing to do it. And I think that's very interesting. Let's see. Uh, Catherine. Oh, I'm sorry, Ben. No, I was just saying he loved the people. Yeah. I mean, that's the kind of love we need to have people. for everybody. Yeah. Everybody. Even those that, that are bristly to us. We need to love them. And, or even those that know, will never listen. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, Catherine made the comment, God keeps appealing even when people are resisting. God's love and desire to save and heal overrides rejection of him. No one will ever be able to say, um, God didn't try hard enough. He, you know, he just gave up and walked away. He does walk away, but that's because we have told him to leave. Yeah, you don't leave a room unless you're told to leave, and that's not God. He's going to hang out with you for a long time. However, whatever it takes, he's willing to do it, and I love that God. Well, we're just about done here. Ben, it's been fun. Glad you're Good here. You. I think you're teaching next, next week. Right. I, I will be. I will be here next. Week. Will you join me as the guest? Maybe. Um, we can see how that works. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what my computer will do. But yeah, okay. I'd love it. I'd, I'd love it. I love the next chapter. So keep reading Isaiah. Keep remembering God's got this. Um, he is still in control, and He loves you uh, more than you will ever know. And we need to just keep praying to keep that hope of knowing that this is not our final episode. 
we have a heaven where the government is right and the government is fair and it'll be wonderful and I'm going to close with a prayer and then we'll move on to um, oh I think we have the children's time next correct all right dear heavenly father we love you we don't love you like we should we don't give you the honor and the glory and the praise that we should we are people who tend to come with a grocery list or an appeal in, you know, that, that 12th hour. Give us that relationship with you that we need. Not the one we want, the one we need. And please let us know that you will fulfill all of our needs. We don't need for that to go and search for that one last thing, that one last thrill, that one last whatever it is that we're searching for. You have all the answers and you will fulfill our needs. And thank you for that, Father. Thank you for this beautiful, overcast, cool, snowy, we're breathing in beautiful day, this beautiful Sabbath that you set aside where you would reach down in time and share time with us, and thank you for that. As always, Father, please forgive us where we fail you. We ask these things in your precious Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I bet you're wondering, why am I dressed like this? Well, this is what you dress like. With these kind of shoes, and these kind of shorts, and this kind of hat, when you're ready to go sailing. This morning I have a story to tell you about a friend of mine, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, and a potato patch. My friend and I, John, we loved to go sailing, and we would go almost every weekend. We took our kids, we had our own little sailboats. They were catamarans, and that means that there's two sides. These catamarans were really fun, but we liked to do more than just sail in our local lake. We would sail down in the Bay of San Francisco. And let me show you a picture of my boat. This is the boat that we used to sail. And that was John right down here. And that's me. And I would take care of the sails and he would steer the boat. Well, we took our catamaran down to San Francisco Bay to do some sailing. And my oldest son was crewing on the boat and we were out having just the time of our lives. We were sailing from the North Bay to the South Bay, and we sailed under the Golden Gate Bridge, and we did all kinds of fun things. And we got back to our landing point, and our friends had their boat too. And we said, you wanna make one last pass under the Golden Gate Bridge? And uh, everybody said, I don't think so. But John and I looked at each other and we said, we'll do it so we turned our boat around and we headed out and the wind caught our sails and as we were sailing we went through this really turbulent area it was going up and down up and down it was called the potato patch the reason it's called the potato patch is because the water was flowing out of the bay and the wind was blowing into the bay. So because the water's going one direction and the wind is going the other direction, it made these big waves. Well, we were sailing our boat and my son was hanging off the side and the one hull was up out of the water and we were just shooting along really fast. It was so exhilarating. And all of a sudden I heard this pop. And I turned around, what happened? Because we knew something had broken. And I looked and our mast, the big pole that holds the sail, had come off of its little 
this little round ball that was holding it. There was a big old uh, screw that held the ball and this post was on top of it. And the mass had jumped down onto another beam. It was round and it had dented it. It hit it so hard. And John and I and Jason, we go, uh oh, we're in trouble. We're heading south and we need to be going back to the North Bay where our cars are and our friends are. And we looked around and we're right in the middle of the bay, right under the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge. And we prayed, Jesus, help us because we can't do this on our own. I looked at John, John looked at me and we said, well, we can't turn into the wind because if we do for sure, the mast will come off and go right through the, the middle of the boat down into the ocean, taking the sails down and we'd be stuck there, right in the middle of the Golden Gate Bay. John said, I think we should jive. That means turning with the wind instead of turning into the wind. So we, we, we did that, we said, okay, I got down on the what we call the trampoline and I put my shoulder right against that, that mast pole that was holding all of our sails. And John slowly started to turn the boat. As he turned the boat, the mast pole started creaking and moving and creaking and moving. And he kept going really slow. And we prayed, Lord, send your angel to help keep this mast where it is. As we kept turning, it stayed there, it creaked, it moaned, it twisted, but it kept where it was supposed to be. And we finally got all the way around and the wind caught our sail and on the other side, and we started sailing back to where we came from. We were so thankful. We got out of the potato patch, we got out of the middle of the bay, and we come sailing right into the little sandy area where we had taken off. And no sooner did we touch land than that big pole that holds our sails slid right off the beam and right through our trampoline. I am convinced the sailing angel put his little thumb on the bottom of that mast and held it right there so that we got back safe from under the Golden Gate Bridge. Now it reminds me of a story in the Bible and I'll read it to you really quick. This is taken from John 6, verses 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew very rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Boys and girls, it's really important in life to let Jesus into your boat. And when you do that, many times the waters calm down and he protects us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending the angels to protect us when we need it. We thank you that you're at it there next to our boat and we pray that you will get into our boat every day have a great sabbath boys and girls ah what a beautiful winter wonderland we found ourselves in today it looks like everything is covered in a delicate untouched blanket of snow the only thing that could possibly make this better would be if someone were to start a snowball fight! We seem to be in the middle of an epic snowball fight. Don't worry though, I know how we can avoid getting pummeled with these freezing projectiles. The rules are simple. I'll give you a name of a Bible character, 
Then I'll show you three snowballs with facts about that Bible character. Two of these facts will be true, but one will not be. That's the snowball that's about to come flying right at you. All you have to do to avoid it, though, is hold up the number of fingers for the snowball that's not telling the truth. One, two, or three. If you get it right, you're still in the game. If not, you can keep playing, but please take a seat. Easy enough, right? Great! Everybody on your feet! It's time for this snowball fight to begin! Our first Bible character is Daniel. Now, which of these is not true about Daniel? One, Daniel spent a night in a den of lions. Two, Daniel prayed regularly. Three, Daniel was Esther's father. Remember, hold up one, two, or three fingers based on which snowball you think is not telling the truth. Okay, time's up. Who's holding up three fingers? <laughs> You're correct. Daniel was thrown into a den of lions because he did pray regularly, but he was not Esther's dad. Good job. Let's try another. Our next Bible character is Adam. Now, which of these is not true about Adam? One, Adam built the ark. Two, Adam was the first man. Three, Adam was married to Eve. Okay, time to get those fingers up. Which snowball do you think is not telling the truth? Time's up! Who's holding up one finger? Because you just avoided a snowball. Noah was actually the person who built the ark. <laughs> Let's do another one. Moses is our next Bible character. Now, which of these is not true about Moses? One, Moses saw a burning bush. Two, Moses walked on water. Three, Moses spoke with Pharaoh. All right, it's time to decide. Which snowball do you think is not telling the truth? Time's up! Who's holding up two fingers? You are correct! Moses never walked on water. <laughs> Let's try another. Ruth is our next Bible character. Now, which of these is not true about Ruth? One, Ruth married Boaz. Two, Ruth was from Moab. Three, Ruth was Naomi's mother. So what do you think? Which of these snowballs is incorrect and therefore about to come flying right at us? Time's up! Who's holding up three fingers? You are correct! <laughs> Ruth was actually Naomi's daughter-in-law. Good job! Paul is our next Bible character. Now, which of these is not true about Paul? One, Paul was swallowed by a fish. Two, Paul used to be called Saul. Three, Paul was blinded by a bright light. It's time to decide which of these snowballs is not telling the truth. That's it, time's up. Who's holding up one finger? You are correct! Jonah was swallowed by a fish, not Paul. Nice work. Mary is our next Bible character. Now, which of these is not true about Mary? One, Mary was married to Joseph. Two, Mary was a carpenter. Three, Mary was Jesus' mother. So, what do you think? Which of these snowballs is not being completely honest? Time's up! Who's holding up three fingers? You should be holding up only two. Joseph was a carpenter, not Mary. Abraham is our next Bible character. Now, which of these is not true about Abraham? One, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Two. Abraham moved to the Promised Land. Three, Abraham was Israel's first king. It's 
time to make your choice. Which of these snowballs is not telling the truth? Time's up! Who's holding up three fingers? You are correct! Saul was actually Israel's first king. Are you still standing? If so, very impressive. We've got one more round to go. Joseph from the Old Testament is our final Bible character. Now, which of these is not true about Joseph? One, Joseph was the son of Pharaoh. Two, Joseph had a colorful coat. Three, Joseph was thrown in prison. Which of these snowballs is not telling the truth? Time's up! Who is holding up one finger? You are correct! Joseph was the son of Jacob, but he worked for Pharaoh. Great job, everyone! Uh, I don't know about you, but I could go for some hot chocolate right about now. Happy Sabbath and good morning. It is a new day, but not an ordinary day. This is the Sabbath, a day set apart for rest and rejuvenation. And boy, do we have a lot to rest from these days. The Sabbath reminds us of the light at the end of the tunnel. It reminds us not just a day when COVID is over, but of a day when sin is over. A day when we can once again rest in the presence of God's love. And because we are Adventists, we believe that day is coming soon. So be of good cheer, friends. We still have much to praise God for. That's what this worship time is all about. We're going to read the Bible, pray together, listen to music, and hear a message. COVID cannot stop the church at worship. So long as God remains who He is, we will remain who we are, His worshipers. If you're joining us from home, this is the time to grab your Bible and your blanket. Couches are pews too, you know. Clear your mind. Leave your worries behind in last week where they belong. And let us look to Jesus and just enjoy him, shall we? Let's start with some music.
Good morning, church family. It's time for prayer. Let's get comfortable and come before the Lord. Good morning, Father. It's a good morning to be here. Happy Sabbath. You tell us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, you ask us to rejoice in you at all times. We love you, Father. We just love you so much. You've always been there for us. You care for us. You will always be there for us. You tell us, Father, to let our gentleness be known to all men. Father, as we look out into our world, our country, our community, our homes, many of us see chaos and the opposite of gentleness. And yet, Father, you ask us to be gentle to all men. We ask for wisdom for our country, Lord. We ask for wisdom for our communities. We ask for wisdom in our homes. Help us to be gentle, Lord. Help us to show you, to show the gospel to others. To show, to show Jesus to others. Forgive us when we have not been gentle. Father, you tell us to be anxious for nothing, but instead to come to you in prayer about everything, about everyone. Father, our hearts are heavy with, with concerns. And you, you ask to take our burdens to make them light. So we want to give our, our burdens to you, Father. We want, we want you to take the place of anxiety. We want to focus on the cross and on you. Father, you, you ask us to be thankful, to worship you. You are the creator, the sustainer of all life of each one of us. We are thankful for all that you have done for us. 
You are the Alpha and Omega, which is the beginning and the end. Father, you know us. You know the numbers of hair, the number of hairs on our head. You love us. You care for the little things in our lives, and we are thankful. We are thankful for what you have done by sending Jesus Christ to this world. Father, Jesus died for us. We are thankful that Jesus put you first, that he always was about doing your will as he lived here on this earth as a man. We want to be more like Jesus. We want to be more like your son. And we are so thankful that Jesus rose again from death, that death was defeated at the cross, and that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of you, Father, and that he will come again and take us to heaven. We don't know when that will be, and you ask us to live our lives each day in confidence, knowing that you are there and that you will come again. And Father, that you, you have things under control. You are on the throne. Father, we are grateful. Give thanks to the Lord, for you are good. Your love and mercy endures forever. Father, forgive us where we have not done your will, where we have not sought your will, where we have put self before you. Father, restore us. Restore our relationships with others. Help us to forgive others who have committed wrongs against us, against your church, against you. Help us to rest in you, Father. You tell us your peace can surpass our understanding, our expectations, our burdens. You tell us you will guard our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, your son. Father, today we want to lift up, uh, again, we want to lift up our country and all that's going on. We, we lift up our families, our friends. We lift up our church. We lift up our pastor today as he brings the word. May your words be his words, Father. May we continue to, to live under your grace and your mercy. Father, thank you for the beauty of another day of life. And we just ask that you would be with those who are ill in body, in mind, in heart, in their soul. And we ask for the salvation of all, not only those we love and know, but those that we do not know. And we ask today if someone at home hears this and, and wants to commit their lives to you, that they would just ask you, Lord, to be in their life and that you will do the rest. In your name we pray, amen. And now it's time for a scripture reading with Jerry. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Our scripture reading is out of 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Amen. Okay, cool. All right, guys. Thank you, Jerry, for that scripture reading. Well done. Somehow no horses were involved. And uh, that's unfortunate. Hoping to see more horses involved. And uh, so next time, Jerry, you're asked to do scripture reading, I think you should be on a horse, near a horse, maybe not behind a horse, on the side of a horse. There should be horses involved. All right, everybody, everybody should pick an animal and do whatever it is they do. Sing next to an animal, pray next to an animal. <laughs> I don't know where this is going or why. So guys, anything interesting happened this week in your country? <laughs> I tell you, when I saw that the Sabbath school lesson was on leadership <laughs> and the, the troubles that Israel had uh, um, and, and 
um, Confucius's statement about you need to have confidence in your leaders, and that's the most important thing. I'm like, wow, I don't think they've ever picked a Sabbath school title that was more appropriate to the week that it uh, it was being featured. And and here we are. We're in the middle of this series, which we're calling Apocalypse Now, Adventism as the Antidote. And, um, and, and this series is all about how Seventh-day Adventists are primed as a people to handle hardship. I mean, we, we study the end times, we talk about the end times, it's in our name, it's in our DNA. I mean, just the whole culture of Adventism is about being ready for the soon return of Jesus. That's why we're called Adventists. Now, does that mean every Adventist out there is some kind of uh, spiritual special forces and they can handle anything? No, of course not, right? We're humans too. And, uh, and, and just like any other group of Christians out there, we have varying degrees to which we are... Uh, I guess successful at living up to the things we talk about. We all need grace, including Adventists. But uh, given that Adventists focus on being ready for the end times, uh, the, the premise of this series is that that should help us to navigate the challenges that we face, that many of us are living with right now, whether it be COVID, whether it be financial challenges, whether it be our political situation. This is this is the people who are who are supposedly all about being ready for the end times, being ready for tribulation, being ready for hardship. This sh this should be our moment to shine, right? I hope I'm not idealizing Adventists too much there. I just think this is this is the moment we were born for. This is the moment we were called for. This is the moment we were made for. So even if you're watching, you're not an Adventist, uh, I, I think you're still going to find this helpful because what we're going to doing in this series is we're going back to the book of Revelation, which is a cornerstone for Seventh-day Adventists in terms of understanding their place and purpose in history. And, and, and we're specifically looking at how we can be overcomers of hardship, of difficulty, of persecution, all those sort of things. Right? How, can we, how can we kind of soar above these moments of crisis, these moments of trial and hardship? That's, that's what we're looking at. That's our focus. So last week we've, we've talked about how Jesus, especially in Revelation chapter 1, is is the one who overcame the end times. How what Jesus went through with uh, people plucking his beard and beating him and ultimately crucifying him, how that was Jesus living through the end times. That was a little microcosm of what the end times is about. And Jesus was faithful during that time. He, he didn't compromise, he didn't give up, he didn't quit. He, he just held to his course, he finished the mission, and as a result, he experienced the resurrection that is promised to all of us after, at the end of the age, at the end of time. Okay, So Jesus has already gone through this. So when we are asking the question, what does the end times look like? I mean, a lot of people out there, of course, are talking about this headline or that country. And there's, there's discussions to be had about that stuff. But I'm just saying, just look at Jesus. Because Jesus has already gone through the end times. You want to talk about persecution? He did it. You want to talk about brother betraying brother? He experienced it. You want to talk about, um, you know, violence and slander and all these things. He went through it all and he did it faithfully. So Jesus, as in all things, is our model. He's our example. He's our template. He's already gone through the end times that still lay ahead of us. And so, hey, because not every human being is actually going to make it to the literal end of the world, um, we all can kind of go through our end times. And this is what I think Jesus is talking about when he talks about us needing to carry our cross. Right? we got to go through our own struggles in life. And, and for those who aren't going to be alive at the end, end, end of time, that is their end times in their life. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm not trying to take away from anything that, the, that Revelation is talking about, about the very end. But I'm just saying we need to, we need to not look at the end of time as something that happens far off in the future or maybe near in the future. It's something in, a, in one way, shape, or form that we all experience in our lives and it's something that Jesus experienced in his. So the purpose of this is we're looking at Revelation and we're trying to figure out how can we live faithfully as Jesus did through the end times. All right? All right. So Jesus overcame the end times. He experienced the reward that is promised to everyone who overcomes in the end times. And this same Jesus who did that in chapter 1, well, when we get to chapters 2 and 3, he has messages for seven specific churches. 
What are those seven churches? Does anybody know what the seven churches are? It's one of those things that you probably had to memorize when you were a kid, memorized in Pathfinders or something. What are those seven churches? First up, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then Pittsburgh. No, wait, Laodicea. That's the seventh one. All right. Did you guys get it? All right, good. Or not good if you didn't get it. But you get it. All right. So these seven churches, these are seven churches that Jesus writes letters to via John. And he, and I think it's worth looking at these seven churches because if we want to be overcomers, we should take note of what Jesus tells these churches because Jesus wants these churches to be overcome, which is why when it comes to every church, Jesus says, you know, to those who overcome, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get this reward. If you don't overcome, this is the consequence because he wants these churches to be overcomers. One of the first things that strikes you about these messages is that they're different for every congregation. Jesus doesn't just send a one-size-fits-all solution to all the churches. He doesn't show up and say, you know what, you seven churches, you guys just need to read your Bible and pray more. Isn't that kind of like our advice to everybody to fix all of their all of their problems, right? Just read the Bible and pray more. You know which churches Jesus tells to read the Bible and pray more? None of them. None of them. That's not his solution to their problems. That doesn't mean it's not an important thing for us all to do. Of course it is. He doesn't talk about their worship music. <laughs> he doesn't talk about their dress at church. He doesn't talk about how big their building is or what lights they use or whatever. You get the point, right? These are not Jesus' concerns with these seven churches. Some of these churches have real problems. None of them involve, uh, you know, these, these things that many churches today get exercised about. It's not about whether they read the Bible enough. It's not about whether they pray enough. What is Jesus concerned about? Hmm? Well, let's get into it. We're going to start with Revelation chapter 2. We're going to look at Ephesus. And we're going to take a good long look at Ephesus. And then we're going to kind of go very quickly through the other churches. Because we don't have all day. I mean, well, we do. You can just leave and go have lunch. But uh, anyways, all right. So here's Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 to 7. I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance... I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Jesus here, the imagery in Revelation chapter 1 is that Jesus is standing among these seven lampstands, which all which represent these seven churches. Okay? And then he says, To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Well, on the plus side, this church works very hard. It, uh, it has perseverance. It doesn't tolerate evil. It, um, you know, when people show up claiming to be apostles the leaders and teachers of this church are like whoa 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 slow your roll down buddy pretty sure that's exactly what they said in greek uh you know we're gonna we're gonna test you we want to make sure that you're going to be speaking the truth and so we want to make sure that you you know we're gonna we're gonna test you we're not just gonna let you go whoopsie we're not just gonna let you go up front and and start preaching start teaching All right this was a big problem actually this was a big problem throughout church history. Just a little side note here, guys. This is why Seventh-day Adventist pastors have um, credentials. We carry credentials. Why? Because in the days of the early Seventh-day Adventist church, like many other Christian denominations, uh, people would just show up at church and say, oh yeah, I'm totally an Adventist pastor. And the congregations would be like, well, let's let them speak then, right? They say they're an Adventist pastor, and then they get up and they just say all sorts of whatever. And so the church realized, hey, we need to give people credentials to, to show a congregation, yes, this person really is a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and, uh, and the, you know, if you want to invite them to speak, go for it. They're, they're good, uh, you hope. And so that's where that comes from, all right? So in the early church, it's a very similar situation. In fact, far worse, right? Because you, you don't have newspapers that have a list of, of uh, ministers or whatever. Uh, people would just show up in these congregations and they would say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm an apostle, I follow Jesus, and how do you, how do you know? 
right? So you have to test these people. A good church would test these people to, to see if they really were who they say they are, okay? So they did that. They endured hardship. Um, I'd say let's give Ephesus an A+. Plus. I mean, come on, if, if I described the church and said all of those things about that church, a church that works hard, it endures hardship well, like it stays faithful, it doesn't tolerate evil, you know, if somebody in their church starts doing something wrong, that church just comes down on it and says you shouldn't do that. When people from the outside come and they want to teach or, or speak or whatever, the church is like, hey, we're going to test you and make sure you're, you're talking about the truth. They did all these things. That is a great church. That's the church we all aspire to be, isn't it? That's the church we all aspire to be. Let's give them an A+. Plus. On the downside, we have verse 4, where it says, You have forsaken the love you had at first. That's the downside. In other words, um, you're going to be lost if you don't repent. So are you telling me this church, this Ephesus church, which says all the, it has all these good qualities... It's going to be lost. Its its candlestick is metaphorically going to be removed from the presence of Jesus. It seems incredible that a congregation of Christians could zealously guard the truth, keep out false teachers, work hard, endure hardship, and still be pushed outside the presence of Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Like, really? After all that good? Now, this idea of forsaking their love uh, is a serious charge. The Greek word uh, behind it is afiemi, which uh, can sometimes describe a divorce. So this is, it's not just like, ah, you know, you forgot what this love is. It, it's like you you have left this love. It's gone. It's, 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 I don't want to say, the word here doesn't mean divorce, right? But this word can sometimes be translated as divorce, just to give you a little bit of an impression of how, how serious this thing is that Jesus is talking about. Um... I like how the NET has the very next verse. It says, therefore, remember from what high state you have fallen and repent. Remember from what high state you have fallen and repent. Doesn't it sound a little bit like Isaiah chapter 14? How you are fallen from heaven, morning star. Talking about Lucifer there, right? You have been cast down to the earth. It it kind of gives you those vibes. Remember from from, uh, what high state you have fallen. Just like here. He's fallen from heaven. He's fallen from a high state. Uh, So Jesus tells Ephesus, look up, see how far you've fallen. Sometimes we need those moments in our life, don't we? Where you just, hey, stop, turn around. Look where you used to be. Look what you used to be doing. Look at the way you used to talk. Look at the things you used to believe. You've come a long way since then. Now, sometimes that's a good thing. You're progressing, you're growing. And sometimes you say, oh, yeah. I used to be better about this. I used to be better at watching my tongue. I used to be better at uh, spending time with God. right? So sometimes God's like, hey, look behind you. You're not where you used to be. Well, that's important because sometimes the paths we take in life are very gradual. We don't even perceive that we're, that we're headed on a downward slope. right? It's just it's so, so slight that we don't realize what direction we're headed until we've traveled a long way and God taps us on the shoulder and says, hey, turn around, Matthew. Look where you used to be. Look where this path has taken you. And that's what Jesus is trying to get this church to do. Ephesus was a vigilant, active church. It is precisely the kind of church Adventists talk about. Active in its community. It keeps false teaching out. It endures trials with patience. Ephesus, you could say, is our ideal of the perfect end-time church. (laughs) Right? I mean... Keep the heresy out, keep the good teaching in, get involved in your community. I mean, this is exactly the kind of church we want. We want to be like. This is the kind of church we would say is a a great church in the end times. But it was a fallen church. Fallen not because it worshipped the beast, that's in Revelation 13, not because it believed the wrong doctrine. It was fallen because love was no longer their reason for being as a church, and specifically this love for Jesus and what he's done for them. In other words, it doesn't matter what you do as a church. It doesn't matter how zealously you guard the truth. It doesn't matter how studiously you're able to keep uh, false teaching out, out of your congregation, out of your church. None of that matters if you've lost that love for Jesus, if that love for Jesus is no longer the fuel which drives everything you do as a church. 
if you have lost that, then it does not matter what else you do, right? This church, Ephesus, will be lost. It will be removed from the presence of Jesus. And that is a terrifying thought, isn't it? Because it would be easy, if you're on the board at Ephesus, it'd be, on, it'd be easy to sit down and say, look at all these good things we're doing. We're doing 10 things right. We're, we're executing at a high level. Maybe the church is growing. All of these things are going well. And you're saying there's one thing we got to work on? Ah, you know, we'll, get, we'll, we'll work on it. But in this case, that one thing is the most important thing, the most essential thing. The thing that if it's broken, the rest of the vehicle doesn't work. The church doesn't work. It's, it's on the wrong path. It's going down. Ephesus describes for us how churches can keep up the form of healthiness or the form of godliness. They're active, they're vigilant, everything we want to be as a church, but they can be hollowed out spiritually. They can be hollowed out spiritually. You know, you can have some trees that have heart rot, and that happens often if you uh, break a branch and you don't do it well, or the tree sustains some kind of damage where it's it's kind of opened up, there's a wound in the tree, and then some, some fungi, some mushrooms, why well, don't eat mushrooms, okay? Uh, it can get into that wound. It goes, it, it, it can go then straight to the heart of the tree, and you will not notice it for a long, long, long time. It will just start growing, in there and you may not notice it from the outside it it will go straight to the heart of the tree and it will start taking over and it will only go about six or seven centimeters a year that's about as far as it'll get it's not very fast and you won't even notice a color difference for a while you i mean you could cut up the tree and you wouldn't even know anything is wrong with it necessarily but over time it just starts hollowing out the inside of that tree it removes that vital stuff in the center. And eventually then the tree is dead. But for many, many years, it would look perfectly fine as a tree. You know, you would walk around and say, yeah, it's a good tree. It's alive. It's doing well. But on the inside, it's being hollowed out. And Ephesus is a warning that this can happen to churches as well. That we can, that you look at that church, man, look at, they're producing this great printed programs. A lot of people are coming to it. Their music is alive. Like the worship is invigorating. They're really making a splash in Peoria. Um, you know, people, there's a lot of buzz about that church. They're putting bumper stickers on their car because they're proud to belong to that church. All these things that we see on the outside and we're like, that church is doing so well. They're, they're teaching the right things, all that kind of stuff. But you don't know. What's going on inside? Are they doing that VBX program because, hey, you know, we should do it, you know, for the kids. We want to do something for the kids. Um, are they motivated by something other than a love for Jesus? Ephesus reminds us that if we're motivated by anything other than a love for Jesus, whether it's duty, whether it's tradition, whether it's just because, hey, I'm good with kids and I want to do this event. If we're not motivated by this this love for Jesus, that isn't our fuel, then nothing we do as a church matters. So be careful about judging churches from the outside. Be careful about judging churches from the outside, or people for that matter, right? Same thing. Uh, what matters is what's going on in the inside. Is the core healthy? So for those of us who are wanting to stand strong during times of turmoil, we have to make sure we don't get hollowed out. We have to pay attention to ourselves. And this is a really hard thing to do as a church. Um, well, right now during COVID, <laughs> it's a really hard thing to do because we can't do much of anything. But, you know, I've thought about that in the early days of this because it was a mad rush back in March for churches to get online. People were buying cameras, some cameras you, you couldn't get. You couldn't get a nice webcam. They were just being, they were just sold out, couldn't make them fast enough. And, um, and this was, you know, it, it was a big rush just to get online, get online, do something online. Don't let the members go dark. You know, don't let, don't let what your church does go dark and your members can't, can't be connected to church. And that was a, a very laudable thing. But at some point you had to ask yourself and I asked myself, it's like, what am I doing here? Am I just putting on a show? You know, is, is that the goal here to just buy a bunch of fancy stuff and put on a show? Uh, because we can is is are we just looking at this as a as an outreach thing because you know it's what we should do as a church we should 
we should try to do something for people who aren't necessarily Adventists. We should try to tell them about Jesus. Or are we motivated in this moment by just an absolute gratitude to Jesus that he's given us so much that even during a time of pandemic, we're able to serve him? You understand what I'm saying? So even during this time, we're asking these questions. You have to be asking yourself these questions. We have to check even more so when things are going well, even more so when the music is is moving, when the preaching is powerful. That may not happen a lot in this church, so forgive me. But when things are going well, you've really got to check. It's so easy to ignore what's going on. Um, it's just kind of like you're you're more likely to spend time with Jesus when you need when you when you're paycheck to paycheck, <laughs> and when you have enough. Uh, well, for a lot of those folks, it's it's hard. It takes more discipline. It takes more effort to 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 stay spiritually grounded, and uh, and we need to make sure that we're that church. We need to make sure that it's just it's a really it's a really scary thought that we can do all of the stuff that we do without really loving Jesus. You realize that? We can do all of this without loving Jesus. We can look at how other churches grow. Other Adventist churches, other Baptist churches, Lutheran churches, whatever. We can look at how they grow. Oh, okay, they have these programs, they advertise, they do all this stuff. We can do that too. Not a big deal. And we can just do that. And it's not necessarily because we love Jesus. It's because we study the demographics of our city. We've, we we and have good advertising practices. We have a good message that connects with people. I mean, right? We can do that without the Holy Spirit. We can do that without a love for Jesus. And that's a scary thing. It is easy to be self-sufficient as a person, as a Christian. Easy to be self-sufficient. We have to learn how to accomplish our mission in ways that rely upon Jesus in order to succeed. We have to find certain things that we that we do as a church that requires us to go out on a limb and say, Lord, we have a lot of talent in this church. We have a lot of resources. But without you, this thing will fail. We need to put ourselves in that position. And that's a scary, scary, scary thing to do. And as we've developed, I'm just going to speak about Adventism for a moment. This is true for a lot of denominations, though, as well. When we institutionalize, when, when we have all these hospitals and schools and conference and union and division offices and everything becomes kind of standardized. I mean, have you seen the working policy? That book is, yeah. Um, when we get to that spot, it's really easy to think our mission is just self-preservation. Our mission is to keep the schools open. Our mission is to keep the hospitals running smoothly. Our mission is to keep churches open. And our goal is to keep this church open at all costs, right? It's, it's, but that's not really what our mission is. That's not what Jesus called us to do. Jesus didn't say your goal is to stay alive in Peoria. He didn't say your goal is to bring in more income. He didn't say your goal is to professionalize. He didn't say your goal is to create a brand in this online world. He didn't say your goal is to accumulate knowledge. Right? We want you all to be smarty pants about the Bible. Memorize the book of Matthew, everybody. That isn't our goal. What is our goal? To go preach the gospel. To go preach the gospel and to do the things he asks us to do. Maybe he has something he wants us to do here in Peoria. We want to stay attuned to his spirit so that we know when he's speaking to us and when he wants us to do something. That's it. That is our job. So we can take this stress off of our shoulders that, oh man, that other church is growing. We need to be doing these things too because it can be distracting. Now, do we want to grow? Sure. Would we love more money? Sure. Uh, you know, would we want our members to be knowledgeable about the Bible and, and to handle themselves in a kind of a professional way? Sure, of course we want all of those things, but that's not our mission. That's not our mission. Okay? If God wanted to close our church down, that may suit his purposes, so be it. Then we'll be a wandering people meeting in each other's homes. We're coming over and we'll do our mission that way. Okay? Right? So I, when when self-preservation becomes our goal, it just it kind of becomes this feedback loop and we stop listening to God. And that's a that's a concern that we have. I'm not I don't know if Ephesus was precisely at that point, but that's a danger for us today. Ephesus reminds us that all the things we do are meaningless if we forsake that first love for Jesus. All right? People talk a lot about social media envy uh, the last few years. 
Uh, you go on Facebook, your friends look so good because what do they do? They take 50 pictures and they just put on the one that looks the best and they put that filter on and all these sort of stuff. You know the secrets. Uh, you see another friend who's in Hawaii vacationing while you look around and see snow. You see another one in Florida and they're on a cruise. One is hugging their husband and they look so perfectly happy. Uh, another one took up cooking during COVID and, and everything they make just looks amazing. And you can look at all this stuff in like five seconds. You just scroll through your Facebook feed or whatever. And you think, oh, I didn't do anything during COVID. I didn't pick up guitar or learn another language. I just see snow around me. You know, maybe my relationship isn't isn't the best uh, right now. And you can just kind of get sad about that, can't you? And it's not fair. And you know it's not fair, but it doesn't mean you don't feel that way sometimes. I wonder if sometimes we get church envy. Or maybe that's just something pastors get, I don't know. Uh, I was in a large church recently, not Adventist church. And it had a, a wall with their history. And I remember seeing, I looked at their membership numbers. And from like the late 60s, I want to say, up until the present, it was just this, just this climb up. Constant climb up. And I was like, come on. <laughs> I, I was like, man, that would be great. That would be great. Not this long decline, this constant incline. And you, and you look online and you see other churches and these awesome videos they're, they're putting out, the, the wonderful sermons that people are giving, the wonderful music that churches are producing. And, you know, we have to remind ourselves that all this is external stuff. I mean, good for them. Don't get me wrong. Good for them. But we don't know what's going on underneath the hood, right? Are they doing this because they love Jesus or not? I don't know. I'm not here to, to say we should judge them. I'm just saying, don't be fooled by the stuff you just see on the surface with other churches or with other people. Because none of that matters, right? We could do a lot of that stuff. Um, I, mean, well, I mean, for good preaching, you'd have to have your pastor get brain surgery. But otherwise, we could do a lot of the other stuff. And it just, it reminds me of what Jesus says. You guys know this text very well, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And that was true of Ephesus. That was true of Ephesus. And it says kind of what Jesus is saying here is basically what what uh, what his message is to, to them in Revelation chapter 2. Hey, I know you guys do a lot of good things. Just because you do a lot of good things, that doesn't mean you guys are, are in. It doesn't mean you guys are a healthy church because you're only a healthy church. When you are doing what you do out of a love for me. And that's something we gotta keep an eye on. So don't don't judge things just purely by the externals. We gotta we gotta make sure our hearts are right. Not just individually as church members, but together as a church. Okay. Point taken. We've belabored the Ephesus point over long. So what can we learn from the other six churches about living in the last days? We're gonna go through them a little bit quick. Okay, so Ephesus. Uh, we learn how crucial it is for a congregation to be motivated by the love of Jesus. All right. In Smyrna, we learn the importance of, of being faithful under fire. Okay. Jesus says, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I love that because I feel like if I was a member of that church, I'd be like, wait, what? What am I about to suffer? Hey, hold on. Jesus, what? What am I about to suffer? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> I feel like you're praying and Jesus is like, Matthew, you're going to have a terrible day tomorrow, but I want you to keep your head up. Like, wait, what? Now I'm suddenly more afraid. <laughs> Do not be afraid. Um, it says, be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. That's what he says. Well, that's great. In Pergamum, we see the importance of uh, how important it is to maintain right teaching. It says, there are some among you in Pergamum who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Likewise, those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, repent therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of, our, of my mouth. We see that image of Jesus with a sword in his mouth uh, in Revelation chapter 19, don't we? Well, we don't know what Jesus is referring to specifically here with the Nicolaitans and the Balaam thing. Uh, but Pergamon is a church that had just gone through trial, gone through difficulty, and uh, and stayed faithful. And as soon as the coast was clear, it seems like a few members got caught up in some kind of false teaching. They weren't like Ephesus and, and were vigilant about that stuff. Uh, they got caught up in it. And God calls the entire church to repent for having harbored these, these uh, false teachings among a minority of members. Now in Thyatira, we have much the same lesson. In Thyatira, those few people with their false teachings actually 
seemed to have become the majority of people in the church, and the faithful followers of God became the minority in their own church. But there's a lot of overlap between um, Pergamum and Thyatira. Now, in Sardis, the church is dead. Just dead. Jesus calls them to wake up and finish the task that he has given them. What does he say? Well, wake up. Strengthen what remains is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and hold it fast and repent. Well, okay. What does this mean here? Well, it means we need to learn resilience. It means we it means we need to strengthen what remains in the sense of I get the image when I read that of a fire that's going out and it's just kind of got the red coals, the embers at the bottom and what do you got to do if you want to get it going again? You got to stir those embers up, get the get the get the heat coming up again, put another log on there. And it seems that Sardis is that church, you know, we say it's a dead church. It's it, it's just kind of almost dead. Not not quite dead. Very close. The fire has gone out. It's just got those warm embers. They need to be stirred up. Um, it says, remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. You realize how many times in the Bible God tells people to remember something? Uh, of course, the Sabbath is a big one. Remember, 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 what you have received and heard, hold it fast and repent. What is he saying here? Okay, well, you guys were taught the truth. You guys were taught the gospel. At one point, you need to you need to remember those days. You need, you need to remember what you were taught. And then he says, hold it fast, hold on to it, and then repent. All right? First remember, second, hold on to that thing. Don't let it go. And then repent. All these churches need to repent. Almost all of them. And he said, in the in the church that keeps on uh, progressing is the church that is is going to make it. So even though this church seems on its last leg, it seems like there's not much left for it to, <laughs> not much left for it to do. Uh, it's almost the fire's almost gone out. Nevertheless, Jesus says, "Hey, hey, just stir it up. Remember what you've lost. Remember what you used to be, and then and repent and return to that." Okay, this is to me. It tells me that the church needs to, um, the church needs to keep progressing. We need to keep getting stronger. We need to keep pressing forward because what happened with Sardis is it, it just kind of like the it just kind of petered out. It started off well. They had the gospel. They had the truth. It just kind of petered out, and they lost momentum and they stopped. And we can't be a church that stops. We got to be a church that that keeps going, doesn't stall. Um, seldom, you know, congregations are full of a diverse group of people. And they live in different ages, right? As we, we progress through the decades, the world around us is very different. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's it's not just kind of one form of gas in the car in the 70s and the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Oftentimes, we have these different dynamics in churches. And something that works in the 80s is not going to work today and vice versa. But uh, it, we just got to make sure we don't stall. If we stall, we got to figure out what's wrong with the... Uh, we got to figure out what's wrong with the engine and, and get it back going again, all right? Okay. So, what do we got next here? Oh, we got Philadelphia. What does Philadelphia say? Oh, man. This is what Jesus tells Philadelphia. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Oh, man. Okay. Well, that makes it really easy. Philadelphia is a persecuted church. Things are not going great in Philadelphia. And, uh, and what does Jesus tell them? Just hang on to what you got. I love that. Jesus does that with two churches here. Two churches that are persecuted. He tells them. Just hang on to what you have. Now, does that mean Philadelphia was a perfect church? Mm, I'm going to guess no. Probably not a perfect church. Probably not full of perfect people. But what's interesting, what I love about this is when a church is going through hardship, Jesus doesn't say, hey, yeah, I know there's wolves at the door, but, you know, you got some things to fix. So here's your to-do list. Man, when they're going through hardship, Jesus is like, hey, I'm not going to put anything else on you. Just hang in there. Just hang in there. Right? This is why I think it's so bad when we, we want to offer one-size-fits-all advice to the church at large, to all the churches in Illinois, to all the Adventist churches around the world, to all the Christian churches around the world. If only they would do this. Um, but that's not how Jesus talks to the churches. 
He knows each church as he knows each individual person. They all have different characters. They all have different circumstances. And, and while it is generally true, because we are fallen human beings, that every church needs revival, every church needs to repent, right? I mean, there's some general things you can say about all churches. There are some churches that are going through something right now, just like there are people who are going through something right now. And, and when they're struggling, that's not the time you come in and say, hey, Here's a list of things you need to work on, right? Jesus looks at those churches just like he looks at those kinds of people and says, just hang in there. You're doing fine. Just hang in there. Here's the reward I'm going to give you. Just hang in there. And I, I love that about Jesus, right? He he tailors each of these messages to the churches as as they need it, Don't doesn't he? He does. All right. Well, what's next? Oh, we have Philadelphia, we need to learn resilience, right? Practice patience, all that stuff. We need to learn to persevere through difficulty. Absolutely. Then we have Adventist favorite church, Laodicea. What does it say here, huh? There it is. Those whom I love and I rebuke and discipline. Those I love. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. There we go. Got it right that time. So be earnest and repent. Well, that's pretty clear. We all know Laodicea. If you've if you've been reading Revelation, this is a good idea this month because we're not going to go through every verse. When you're reading a, a verse like this coming from Laodicea, you know what Laodicea's problem is. They're lukewarm. They're neither hot nor cold. And Jesus said, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And he has the strongest things to say to, to Laodicea. We're only taking a little snippet here because I think this is an important thing we learned from Laodicea, that we need to learn the importance of accepting correction from God as a church. We need to learn the importance of accepting correction of God as a church. Because sometimes, hey, we're used to doing our thing. We found success in it in the past. And if God speaks through somebody, and it could be the janitor, it could be a deacon, eh, occasionally the pastor, it could be any member. Uh, so many times does God speak through somebody who is kind of like one foot in the church and one out. Like they see something that nobody else sees who are in the thick of it. And they said, yeah, you know, this needs to be fixed. We could do better at this. And you're like, man, that's true. And if that's God speaking to the church, we can't be so proud of our past accomplishments. We can't be so proud of, um, you know, our identity and our, you know, all these sort of things that we, that we can't listen to that. Because all of these churches, as we've seen, except for the ones who are undergoing persecution, and I'm telling you, when they're not undergoing persecution, I'm sure Jesus would have some things that they need to work on. All of these churches have things to work on. No church is perfect. And, and, and we need to allow the Spirit to correct us where the Spirit wants to correct us. And we, we know, based on what Jesus told Laodicea, that he only corrects those people that he loves. So the only time we should worry is when we're not receiving correction from God. And I know it's not fun to receive correction. All right, I don't like it. You don't like it. We don't like it when anybody corrects us, do we? And especially when it comes to spiritual things, right? Because we've told ourselves we got it all put together. I know that's not you. That's somebody else, right? But we told ourselves we got it all put together. I have the truth. You know, I'm on the right path here. We don't really like it when someone offers us correction about these things. But man, if we're not receiving correction from God regularly, then we don't have a relationship with God. He's saying, those whom I love, I rebuke. In, in other words, he's, he, you know, I'm, I'm trying to correct them. If I love you, I'm, I want you to be better. I want you to be better. And Jesus does it, of course, in the best way possible, uh, out of an abundance of love and concern for us. And and we need to be listening to him. If our if our congregation, if your congregation has been on the same path for 800 years and you haven't changed, um, you know, maybe we, maybe you haven't been hearing from God and, and need to make those little course corrections. Sometimes it's a big course correction, but sometimes it's just a little tilt of the wheel, right? And we don't, and a, a turn of the wheel is not always a change of direction, all right? You, you're sitting in your lane on the highway, you're in the right lane, you're going, let's say, 75, but if you're uh, being honest, 81. And what are you doing when you're in that are you just like hands off the steering wheel? I mean, maybe if you have a Tesla. But are you hands off the steering wheel? No. Okay, you have your hands on the steering wheel. Um, are you just holding it still the whole time? No, because you recognize that even when the road is straight, 
the car doesn't go perfectly straight. And you're having them just move left a little bit. You have to move right a little bit, left and right, left and right, all the time. Why? Because you keep changing directions? No. You need to make those little course corrections in order to stay in your lane. Because we recognize that the kind of the we human beings are out of alignment, just like the cars. We're out of alignment. And if if we're hands off about things, we may start out in the right lane, but uh you fall asleep on yourself for a few seconds and you're gonna be off the road or in the other lane or somewhere else you don't want to be. So we recognize corrections are needed as we go on through through life as we're driving down this road and not not to go in different directions necessarily but even to stay in the direction that we were intending to go from the beginning right so god sets you in this direction you need to make little adjustments just to stay in your lane because there's 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 a part of us that wants to veer off to the right or veer off to the left just naturally it happens and we need to correct against that we need to hear God wanting to correct us just in order to stay in the right, in the correct lane. All right. So when we put all these seven churches together, what do we have? All right. First, you have some defensive qualities. Don't let bad theology in, right? Man, these are the man, the wall qualities or woman, the law qualities, uh, uh, the law, the wall qualities. Okay. Uh, don't let bad theology in, hold on to good teaching be faithful under fire. Just, just hang on. That, that, those kind of pieces of advice are, are defensive by nature. You just picture a fortified city. You need to put guards on the walls to keep the bad people out. You need to secure the, the food and the treasure and the things that you have on the inside to make sure that, that nobody on the inside is going to take it and run it out to the guys on the outside. Or whatever. I mean, you know, protect your position. Keep what you have. Don't let the bad guys in and, uh, and all of that, right? Hold, hold your positions. Hold, be faithful under fire. But then some pieces of advice that Jesus gives them are offensive in nature. Go out there, leave the walls, and go do the thing that Jesus called you to do. Go tell the world about him. Don't quit. Uh, keep growing stronger. Right? you got to keep exercising. Get out there. Get active. And these are things we leave the walls to do, be making an impact in our community. We have to leave our walls to do that. So you have a mixture of defensive and offensive pieces of advice. And above both of them is the advice to Ephesus, that Jesus is looking for churches who will do everything they do out of a sense of love and loyalty to him. And that's most important. So when you put it all together, you realize there's not a one-size-fits-all way of doing church. All right, When a church is under persecution, like Smyrna or Philadelphia, Jesus tells them to emphasize those defensive qualities. Just defend the fort. Stay faithful under fire. Uh, when a church is not under persecution, Jesus uh, tells churches like Sardis to get off their butts and get out there, you know, and do something. Stir those embers. Get that fire lit again. Get moving. Don't just kind of hunker down behind your wall. So this is why we can't have like a one-size-fits-all piece of advice to churches because it is going to depend on where that church is at, what, where they're at in their, in their mission, in their walk with God together, all those kind of things. Jesus' counsel to each church depends on their circumstances. And we have to be in tune with the Spirit of God to know what Jesus is telling our particular church or your particular church. Because what he's telling Peoria to do may be different than what he's telling Galesburg to do or Chicago to do. All right. Hopefully this is good news because I think sometimes... Uh, Maybe you don't experience this as much as I do, but sometimes some very, very well-meaning Adventists will go find a collection of things, for instance, Ellen White said, about what churches need to do. They print off all 150 statements she ever wrote to churches. I mean, it's probably more, but you get my point. Um, and what, you know, this church needs to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. And then they, they print it off and they give it to the pastor and says, this is what we need to be doing right now. And my response to that is, okay, all of that is fine. Does it apply to this congregation at this moment? Do you think that if Jesus wanted to, Jesus could have made a list of everything that the church and its members needed to work on in Ephesus? I mean, every flaw, every defect? Of course he could have. Man, it would have been a mile long, right? He didn't. What does Jesus do? Here's the one thing you need to work on. Here's the two things you need to work on. That's what he says. The, presumably the things that are most pressing, the things that are most important. Those are the things you need to work on, guys. It doesn't overwhelm them with a list of things that we need to be doing right now. It is tailored for that particular congregation. And, and, and it's tailored 
for the thing that they need that is most critical for them to be working on at that moment, right? So the question then is, what does Peoria need to do? What does a church in Chicago need to do? What does a church in Australia need to be doing? What does a church in Germany need to be doing right now? What would Jesus say to your particular congregation or my particular congregation that he, he wants us to work on? Well, this year, I want us to be listening to the Spirit, what the Spirit is saying to our churches. And I think we have to be really intentional about deepening our relationship with God this year. And I, and I don't just mean individually. I find it really interesting that Jesus wrote these letters to churches. I find it really interesting that Jesus is talking about congregations being saved or lost. I don't know how all of this works, but it seems very clear that our personal salvation is in some way tied up with our church's salvation. Okay, now we know we're saved as people, as individuals. But there's something about how there's something about how we relate to each other in a congregation that impacts that salvation. In other words, fine, maybe you read the Bible and pray a lot. You have a good relationship with God. But if you're a, a toxic presence in your local church, I think that will not work favorably for you, okay? I don't want to get into the weeds in this because Revelation doesn't explain exactly how that works. We don't have as much, uh, as many statements, or at least we don't emphasize them, I'll put it that way. As Protestants, we don't talk about corporate salvation as much, like us as a people. And as a result, I think one of the byproducts of our, it, for one of the implications of that for our church life is that people just come and go as they see fit because they don't think that their belonging to a church has any impact whatsoever on their own personal walk with God, right? I'm coming in here as an independent contractor. I may be a member of this congregation on paper, but, you know, I come and go as I see fit. Um, but we have a responsibility to one another. We have a responsibility to one another. I mean, Jesus tells one of these churches, hey, you have some people in your congregation that are, are teaching dangerous and destructive things. You guys need to repent. Even though most of the church, in that case, uh, seems to be doing just fine. Nevertheless, you guys are not doing fine because you have this thing going on in your midst. So you're responsible for it as a church. You're responsible for what happens in your congregation. And, and, and don't just let it go on because it's dangerous, Jesus is telling them. So there's, there's something there that's worth exploring. There's something there that's worth understanding. The way our individual salvation, our individual relationship with God relates to our, our corporate relationship with God as a local congregation, whatever local congregation you're a part of. There's an impact there. There's a, there's, it, somehow that works, and I don't know exactly how that works. But it, it works. And we see that, of course, with ancient Israel, with God's covenant people, uh, how sometimes there was a few, there was an Achan in the camp, and God told the leaders of Israel, hey, go do something about that, or it's going to or, or reflect upon all of you, right? It's, it's not good for all of you. Well, Moses could have said, well, I'm fine with God. You know, <laughs> not my problem. That dude over there is doing that. He better get his act together. No, no, no. It was Moses' responsibility. It was the elders of Israel's responsibility to go deal with that, wasn't it? And it, it probably would not have gone well for them if they had not dealt with it. It probably would have hurt their relationship with God if they had not dealt with it like God asked. So we're, we're tied to each other, guys. When we say that we're a church family, I hope it's not just a rhetorical thing that makes us feel better. We really are a church family, and, and we're responsible for each other to a certain degree. We're, we're accountable to one another. And maybe it takes something like covid where everything is going crazy and we can't see each other like we used to, to remind us of how important it is for us to to be solid, not just to have good spiritual lives individually, but to have a good spiritual life together. That's why I'm really happy that Teresa has uh, been starting up our uh, Meet in the Middle, some prayer time here at the church. Last week was the first time that that happened. So I hope you can maybe attend this next Wednesday if you feel comfortable with that, coming to the church, praying together wear your mask, you know, social distancing, all that stuff. But we need to be spending some time together as as a congregation. We need to pray together. We need to go out in faith together. Um, because we're, 
we matter as a congregation. If Jesus were to write a letter to the church that is in Peoria, well, just like in John's day, John wrote that letter on behalf of Jesus, sent it to the church in Laodicea, and what did they do? The leaders, they read that letter to the entire congregation. It wasn't just to the pastor or the elders. It was for the entire congregation. And then the congregation has to decide what they're going to do with it. So if Jesus was going to write a, a letter, he wouldn't just write it to me. He wouldn't just write it to the elders or the board. He'd write it to the congregation and say, what are you guys going to do about this? Are you going to fix the things I've asked you to fix? And, uh, and, and all that. We're responsible to him. Uh, each and every one of us as a, as a church family. Um, so we need you. We need you to step up and volunteer. We need your prayers on behalf of the church. We need you to pray. We need to be praying for each other. Uh, we need to, in every sense of the word, be a church family. Because at Revelation 2 and 3, it's about how congregations, not individuals, are able to stand in the end. Sometimes I think when Adventists talk about the end times, we're like, well, you know, such and such thing happens. I'm out of here. What about the rest of the church? What about your congregation? Jesus, in Revelation 2 and 3, is concerned about how well the congregation will be able to stand in the last days. Not just individuals, but the congregation. So how can we help our church to be ready? Not just me be ready. How can we help our church to be ready? To be faithful under pressure, to, to never lose that first love that we had for Jesus, uh, to keep the bad teachings out, to keep the good teachings in. Right? These are things. This is the work of an entire church, not just a good pastor, not just a good elder. It's the work of the entire church working together. Okay? Because I want our church and I want your church to, to stand through trial. When a curveball comes, and we've had a curveball these last 12 months, guys. When a curveball comes, yeah, of course there's going to be some awkwardness. There's going to be some adjustment. Things aren't going to be the same. You're going to lose some things. You're going to gain some things. But, but as a church family, say, you know what? We're going to adjust. And we're going to maintain these bonds because we love each other and we love the God whom we serve. And we're going to get through this thing together. You know, your instinct when the when the chaos happens is to grab each other and hold on. And that's when we need to be grabbing on even more tightly to each other, isn't it? Let me just say one final word and then I'll pray this out. Uh, and this is about the what happened with the Capitol building earlier this week. Uh, just two quick things about that. Something I've been saying for a long time is that we we all think we're right about our political views. <laughs> um, as Christians, I said this back in October when we did a series on this, do not get sucked in to the hyper-partisan, cruel, winner-takes-all political climate that we have going on. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of been distilled down to a black and white, it's all good versus evil, and, you know, I'll do anything for my cause, and all that kind of stuff. It, it doesn't matter which political party we're talking about. Uh, just remember, you serve a God who does care what's going on in this country. He's concerned. He wants what's best for Americans and Canadians and everybody else. Um, but, but God is bigger than this moment. And so just, I think this moment, they want to kind of shrink your view down to this very, very, very narrow way of looking at things. And you've got to step back from that and say, um, the Bible talks about a much larger story going on in the world. And that's the one I'm focused on. And we can, through our kindness and our, our listening to people and not jumping down their throats on social media and all that kind of stuff, we can, we can help show people what how it should be working how society should be working and that they can argue about the existence of god all they want i don't want to argue with them about it i just want to bring them some food <laughs> to my neighbors i just want to check on them i just want to listen to them when they're frustrated let them vent without me being drawn into it and joining them right just listen to people and care about them there's never been a more important time to do that than right now um, and i know it doesn't seem like a lot but it really is it really is. Imagine if if uh, a million Adventists and a bunch of Baptists and a bunch of others were just known at this moment for not jumping into the fray, but we were known for just patience and kindness and, and love for each other and just helping to heal these wounds and helping to calm this country down from the anger that, that is raging right now. Um, I think that's a really important ministry that we have. Uh, the second thing I want to say about that is 
you know, we're doing this series on the end times, and maybe some of you guys are skeptical. It's like, yeah, you know, we talk about the end times forever, right? Uh, I would say don't take stability for granted. When when the people who stormed the Capitol, many of them brought, obviously, weapons. They brought plastic zip ties, which the military uses to, uh, you know, tie up people who they, they need to incapacitate them, so they, they render them uh, not a threat. And they were, you know, they brought a noose. <laughs> In Arizona, they brought a guillotine to chop off heads, I mean, whether they intended to use it or not. People are they're talking about executing people as they ran into the building. Um, you read the accounts of the representatives and senators. I mean, all they knew, they were hunkered down. There was only a few security personnel between them and this mob. And if this mob was intent on, you know, breaking through and, and killing them all. They, they didn't, they feared for their lives in that moment. We... Don't take the, the stability, the order of things in this country or any other country for granted. You just never know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I'm, I'm thankful to God that we seem to be okay at the moment. Um, but now is the time to be preparing f for your life to be right with God. The end times is not necessarily a thing that's many years away. It could be very near at hand. Uh, if not globally, then maybe for you. And... Um, we need to we need to be this kind of people who can handle a crisis. We're faithful under pressure. We we know how to filter the good from the bad, right? The truth from the error. Um, and most importantly, we don't lose that that love that we have for Jesus, which is really easy to do right now. It's easy to be angry right now. Don't lose that love you have for Jesus. You just keep centered on Him, keep anchored on Him, and uh, and we'll be okay. We'll be okay. Let's pray together. Father God, I just thank you for this this time that we have, um, all the craziness going on in the world around us. We're, we're here, we're live streaming. We have these songs and, and stories that we're telling, scripture and prayers on opening the Bible. And God, it's all a gift for you, from you. And we offer we offer it back to you for the strengthening of this congregation and anyone else who's listening their encouragement, sometimes, Lord, for correction. Because we know, Lord, that when you want us to change, it's because you love us and it's for our own good. And we want to be people who are willing to listen to you, who are softened by your spirit in an age when the hearts and minds of many, many people have grown hard and fortified and brittle and hostile. And those, that's not the kind of people we want to be. We want to be people who are formed by your spirit and in your image. So, Lord, I just ask for grace. We, always, we, we don't always succeed at being the people you've called us to be. Uh, we're thankful for that grace. But now, Lord, as we're about to enter a new week after the Sabbath, just pray for that, that second chance, that 50th chance, that one millionth chance. Um, be patient with us. Deal kindly with us, Father, through your Son, Jesus, because it's in his name, Lord, that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us for our Sabbath stream. Hope you guys have a great rest of your Sabbath. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for worship today. We've prayed and preached. We've sung and read scripture. And the goal of all of this is to bless God, to give him our attention and affection. But I hope that you were blessed in this act of blessing too. Enjoy the remaining Sabbath hours. Use them to continue to reconnect with your creator and his creation. And then go unleash yourself in the world this week. Be this bundle of optimism and hope and confidence and joy because you know that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sits on the throne. You know that he loves you and he has chosen you. This life of worship does not end right here at noon on a Saturday. It is only just beginning. So go forth into this world. Grace and peace be with you, my friend. We'll see you next time.